Awesome. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, so if you just bear with me while I get this pulled up. Great. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm excited to get to share a little bit of my work with you today um, and hopefully give you a little bit of a sneak peek into what imaging and analysis looks like in neuroscience uh, here at Oxford. So um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Marissa and I'm currently a second year DPhil student at Oxford. Um, I work in the Pearson, Vysovsky and Molnar labs um, and that's in the Department of Physiology, Anatomy and Genetics. So my background is in biomedical engineering for undergrad, and then I came to Oxford, did a master's in neuroscience, and now I'm continuing on in the DPhil. And uh, so my work focuses on the brain, um, on analyzing the brain and trying to better understand how it works, what are the functional and neuro and anatomical consequences of different manipulations, which I will go into here. So this is a mouse brain and comparative anatomy is important. That is comparing different insights that we see in animal species to human brains, um, because there's a lot we can learn from animals and specifically mouse brains. And this outermost layer here, of the brain. You can see my mouse. It's the cerebral cortex and humans have a cortex, mice have a cortex. And so we can look at mouse brains and study it and try to understand how does the cortex wire? How do different cells and neurons in the cortex communicate with other cells and neurons in the cortex um, to then compare to humans and see in different disease states what goes wrong and how do we fix it? So if we zoom in, on the cortex, um, there are different layers. The cortex is a layered structure. There are traditionally six layers with these layers at the bottom um, being split into two, layer 6A and 6B. And while we do know a lot about the cortex, there is so much that we still do not know. Um, and my work focuses on trying to neuroanatomically characterize different cells in the cortex and how that relates to behavior. So today I'll focus on the imaging and the analysis side of things. How can we zoom in and take pictures of the cortex? How can we count and quantify cells that are in the brain? So these cyan blue colored dots, these red dots, how can we count those and how can we compare them in healthy conditions and diseased conditions, both to characterize what's happening, what's going wrong, and how do we fix it with different, say, pharmacological or drug interventions? So I'm particularly interested in these red cells here, and this is the deepest layer of the cortex. It's called layer 6B. And this cell population is important because it constitutes remnants of the neurodevelopmental subplate. So when a baby is growing, when it's an embryo and the brain is just developing, we don't have this layered structure. There's this structure called the subplate, which as these other layers grow, the subplate dies and the remnants exist along this innermost region. And historically, people thought that this region was functionally insignificant. Or vestigial, but a lot of evidence now suggests that it's actually very important in adulthood, exerts top down modulatory control over other regions, and is implicated in diseases like autism, epilepsy, pot potentially upper motor neuron disease, ALS. Um, so these cells are important, and also because they're the only cells in the brain which respond to this over here. And this is a neurotransmitter called orexin. There are receptors for erection in layer 6B. So the idea is if signals from other parts of the brain are being scattered around, if the cortex plays a role for erection mediated behavior, such as wakefulness and feeding, then layer 6B is most likely the substrate for these behavioral physiological consequences. And so how can we try to test this? How can we try to manipulate the anatomy and see what's happening? Well, we can add what's called the fluorescent reporter so that when we image the cells, the cells glow red. And there are genetic mechanisms and genetic engineering that happens to facilitate this. But in short, all you need to know is that these cells will glow red. 
we add additional manipulations to these constructs in these cells that are glowing red so that they are functionally augmented, so the cells are bigger, they're hyperactive, or they're functionally silenced. So the cells exist, but they're quiet. And I want to study this and to see how this changes the rest of the brain. And again, this is the only layer that responds to orexin. And the question is, how does functionally silencing and augmenting this population alter the cortical neuroanatomy? And then how does that relate to behavior? We always want to tie it back to behavior. We always want to tie it back to the human relevance and the eventual, hopefully therapeutic significance of the insights that we can gain from imaging and analysis. So I'm going to walk you through this process and how we get from a brain to a zoomed in picture of a brain to an overall brain wide quantification of the cells and then comparison between different states. So to start this, we have this little section of the brain and this is imaged in 3D. So you have multiple different sections and we zoom in and write these different codes and programs that semi automatically detect where the cell bodies are, where the neurons are. And again, for those of you who may not know, neuron brain cell and they have a cell body and branches that extend, which we can detect in yellow here. And they extend to other regions of the brain. They communicate with other cells in upper cortical layers, across cortical regions. And these are some of the other cells they communicate with. And here we've detected what are called parvalbumin positive interneurons. And so by looking at the different combinations of these cells and trying to see and understand how they communicate with these subplate remnant cells, not just in small regions, but across the entire brain, we can try to better understand what are the effects of manipulations to these subplate remnants. So here we're, we're filtering through different channels. We're zooming into subcortical regions, so regions below the cortex and then extending up into the cortex. Again, um, looking at these different combinations. So again, this is the semi-automated detection. Zooming out to the entire section. If we go up here, this brain region is in the primary somatosensory cortex. Um, and that means that that's the brain region responsible for signals coming from your brain, from the rest of your body um, to sense things like touch. Um, once we have the detections, we can map this into 3D space. We can register the cells to what's called the Allen Brain Atlas, which is basically a map. And I'm going to go into more detail on this. You take multiple pictures. Um, they're called serial sections across different parts of the brain, anterior, posterior axis, and then different types of cells. So here you're seeing um, parvalbumin interneurons. Um, in different colors, we can label different brain regions. So in the bright red here, um, these are defined by the brain atlas or this brain map to be prefrontal areas. In green, um, you can see color coded all these different regions, and they may look a little bit boxy or triangular, but that's just because there are so many different layers and so many different brain regions, which kind of alludes to the power of a program like this and programs like this and anatomical quantification methods like this, because otherwise, um, and what has been done in the past is students are left and DPhil students are left manually counting each of these cells, which is not fun, as finding more efficient ways to analyze the cells uh, is always a goal in the work that we do. Because as you can see here, there are a lot of different cells that are difficult to count without sophisticated computational methods. We aren't just looking at one part of the brain, as you saw in the last part of that video. We're looking at images from the anterior to the posterior end of the brain. So anterior, if you think of, I don't know if you can see my head, but the closest to your forehead and posterior would be towards the back of your head. Um, so the anterior region of a mouse brain is in the top left corner of your screen, whereas the most posterior region would be in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. 
And you can see that in different brain regions, we have different patterns of these red cells, um, the subpopulation of these subplate remnant cells. And that's important to note because it means that the effects of these cells will be different across other brain regions. So we can't just look at one region when we're analyzing cells and think that any differences will ubiquitously translate to other brain regions. Um, we must assume that there are differences, account for that, and be sure that when doing experiments and analyses, we are looking at the same brain regions and keeping careful controls. So in order to start this entire analysis pipeline, um, we refer to what is called the Quint pipeline. And the Quint pipeline is a paradigm that was um, published in 2019. It was a Yates 2019 paper. And um, Human Brain Project, eBrains, it involves the step number one, first imaging, second cell segmentation, which is basically counting cells, step three, mapping cells. And I will go into what each of these steps are in more detail. Step four, basically combining the cell counts and the cell maps in order to basically assign a, an address to each of the cells. So let's say a cell exists in the front part of your brain. We're going to assign an address to that, saying that the cell exists in the front part of the brain. And then we can map it into 3D space along with all other parts of the brain and different types of cells. Um, to then make graphs and do analyses and try to see if differences arise between genetic manipulations, and if so, what are those differences? Uh, this is a complicated looking schematic representation of what this pipeline looks like. And then for part of my research, some of the computational changes and additions um, that I've made, which not only helps you look at the cells themselves and the densities in different brain regions, but also things like how big are the cells? Um, where are the cells branching to and which cells are they trying to communicate with? Um, and looking at the cell properties and um, what the cell body, the soma, and the branches look like that's called morphometrics. So step number one, um, we start out with this big section. And if you're if you've used a microscope before um, in high school, sometimes we use uh, these light microscopes and you look through the eyepieces and you can see things that are really small. Um, to get an image like this, we use what is called spinning disk confocal microscopy. And what that means is it's a much bigger microscope. Um, you can see much smaller things and it shines lasers on the tissues, which when it hits cells like these, these red cells, um, which I showed earlier, they glow red essentially. And we can add different chemicals and different stains through processes called immunohistochemistry, which lights up and makes other parts of the brain glow, like these yellow cells. These yellow cells are a more true marker of subplate remnant cells. They're called complexin three, but I'm just going to refer to them here as yellow and red cells for the purpose of illustrating this pipeline and cell analysis. Another thing that's interesting that you can see in these full sections using spinning disk microscopy is that um, instead of only looking at small regions, you can see what are called projection regions of the cells that we're interested in. So qualitatively, you can look and you can see, well, there's a massive area here in the middle that's glowing red, but there are actually no cell bodies there. No full cells exist in that region. These are the branches that are coming from all the way up here in the cortex. And this is actually very well defined. There's a large and historic body of research that's characterized these different networks that go from the cortex through this region here and into this area, which is called the thalamus. And the thalamus is the relay station of the brain. And there are complex networks of communications that happen to and from the cortex and the thalamus. And this facilitates all sorts of things that we do, that mice do, um, like sensation, perception, motor outputs, movement, everything happens 
through this network of the cortex and the thalamus called thalamocortical or corticothalamic communications. So being able to fully see the big picture using spinning disc confocal microscopy is quite useful on the imaging side of things, then leading to the analysis. So we start with the full section. And if we, for now, just to illustrate segmentation, step two, I'm going to zoom into this region here. And if we break it down and first look at the red cells, we do this automated cell detection to start the analysis, which picks up all of the red cells. And this is quite remarkable because by doing this automatically, there are some pipelines and programs which even use artificial intelligence to do this. Um, it saves you from manually having to count all of these cells, which would be very time consuming. And not only can we count these red cells, we can then look at different colors, different channels, and see which red cells are also yellow. So splitting them into basically two subpopulations, red cells which do and do not also express this complex in three, this yellow color. And then in reverse, we can detect the yellow cells and we can flip it around backwards and say, OK, of the cells that are yellow, which ones are also red? So splitting these into two subpopulations. So using a pipeline like this allows for a very high throughput and high level way to count cells and to identify very precise differences in cells, cell subtypes, and how that relates to differences in function. So now zooming back out to the full section and applying this method of identifying the cells across the entire brain, we get these little white dots, which we can then in this step three, we can map to a standard brain atlas. Um, this is the Allen Brain Atlas, and there are many different mouse brain atlases that exist. There are human brain atlases that exist, kind of like maps. Um, let's say you're using Google Maps for the University of Oxford, and you are standing at the RADCAM. If there was a drone flying overhead that said you were at the RADCAM, that would be like putting one of these little cells here in this area, which is the primary somatosensory cortex. So it's assigning cells addresses in different regions of the brain and then relating that to the overall structure. So say relating where you are at the RADCAM to the overall university. Um, and this program is called Quickney, and you can see it's not perfect at all. Um, this does not line up with this, but generally they are in the same region. So what we can do is apply what are called nonlinear refinements to make these areas more precise. And there are many different landmarks that you can use to try to align this map, this atlas to your brain section, um, because all brains are a little bit different. None of them are a cookie cutter exact representation of the atlas, but it's close enough. And then with nonlinear refinements, again, that's this part of step three right here, we can get a mapping that is quite accurate, especially when you can define these different regions. Um, and then we combine the two so you can see there are these little dots now that are overlaid with this brain map. We can put that then into a program called MeshView to visualize what it looks like in three dimensions. So now that was step four, now we are in step five. And we can look at a single section, um, which these dark burgundy cells are the equivalent of these red cells up here. And then when we look at it across the brain and across many sections that we saw previously, it looks like this. And then when we look at the blue colored cyan cells and add them in and give them different colors, depending on which brain region they're in, we get complex clouds of cells like this, which only starts to give a little bit of insight into just how complicated the brain is, how many different types of cells in the brain there are. And we don't fully understand even which types of cells exist. And so each step that we can take towards trying to better characterize where the cells are, what types of proteins or colors 
uh, they express under the microscope will bring us one step closer to trying to understand the basics and the foundations of many different types of diseases. Um, you can do many different analyses then with these cells that are spit out and there are programs and I'm, I've blurred this out um, because this is data that I'm collecting now and analyzing as part of my research but this is just to illustrate the massive variety of information that you can pull from pipelines like this and once you see your results you can identify hotspots or areas where it looks like there is something happening between, for example, these red cells that are genetically manipulated so that they're either, again, augmented, so they're more active, they're bigger, or they're silenced. So they still exist and they glow red, but they're functionally silenced. And when you see and pinpoint these hotspots using the pipeline, um, you can then, again, zoom in and see these differences that are quite striking. So this column in the middle, this is the cell, these are the cells that are functionally silenced. Um, so this means that the cells grow, they are still there, but they can't talk with neighboring cells. Um, if, you've, if you've done uh, biology, uh, if you've done A levels in biology, you might have come across or heard of the synapse. Um, there are modifications genetically that are done in the synapse that makes it such that the cells cannot release neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. Um, so presynaptic presynaptic vesicular release is hindered, um, and the cells cannot do anything. They can't communicate afterwards. Whereas um, in these cells here, um, P10 is the modification where the cells are augmented. So you see these big branches, these streaks of red and this color, which um, reflects, it, it doesn't necessarily indicate, but it reflects that the cells are just big and hyperactive. Um, and uh, you can just see qualitatively just by eyeballing it. We can put numbers to it as well using this pipeline, but um, the cells are bigger, but there are actually less of them overall in total count. And when you do the overlay and the what's called multiplexing using this pipeline, so when you identify the combinations that do and do not have yellow as well, um, you can see that it is only or it is predominantly the cells that stay with this manipulation are also the ones that are yellow. So the ones that don't have yellow as well are the ones that don't seem to be here as much anymore, which is very interesting and very relevant um, for the re for research and for studies that are ongoing, especially regarding a mutation like this, which has been hypothesized to exist in conditions like um, autism and epilepsy. Uh, this is something now here at the end, which I would just like to highlight um, because this is a biochemical pathway that's related to the P10 mutation. So the augmenting of the cell population that I just showed right here. So P10 exists here in this pathway and it is a negative regulator of the mTOR pathway. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the details of this, but essentially this is to I highlight that drugs such as rapamycin um, and a newer drug called Torin-1 are potential candidates that could be considered to, I guess, fix or rectify conditions that could be related to this manipulation, this hyper excitability that could be related to these bigger cells, these brighter branches, that's clearly very different to these ones where the cells are silenced. Um, also to highlight that these are different across brain regions. So this is in a motor region, which is responsible for uh, motor function and movement and S1, which is sensation, so primary somatosensory cortex, which is responsible for processing and receiving inputs from the periphery, again, like touch.
Um, so all of the work that is done in the imaging and the analysis is again with the goal of therapeutic translation. It's keeping in mind different diseases that are relevant to what we're looking at and trying to think of if these mutations are causing these differences in neuroanatomy, if we can analyze it, can we then apply drugs and see if we again image and, an and analyze it with the drugs applied, does it fix what we see as being different? And could this then lead to behavioral changes and contribute to processes involved in drug development? So I hope that overall uh, this talk has been a sneak peek into one application of how cell and image uh, analysis and just imaging processes in general um, can be used to address what very quickly become difficult scientific questions. Um, I hope that you've seen what a mouse brain looks like and seen different colors and different stains uh, that can literally light up um, otherwise elusive parts of the brain and different types of cells. Um, I hope you've learned that the cortex is a six slash maybe even seven layered structure and that these different layers look very different. They do different things and that by genetically manipulating, by augmenting or silencing specific layers of the cortex, this does result in changes in other cell populations in different regions of the brain and that these differences are not homogenous. The cortex cortical and subcortical regions are very heterogeneous and you cannot restrict your analyses to one brain region and assume that that will be the same across all other brain regions. The brain is very complex and the more we can try to see the bigger picture while also of course zooming in into smaller regions, the more we'll be able to get a holistic view of how the brain works. Where are these cells? What do they do as complementary to an array of different scientific methods? For example, electrophysiology, which looks at the electrical properties of these cells. All the different methods are very complementary and imaging and analysis is one very important piece to the puzzle. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your time, for listening to the talk. I'm very happy to take questions that you might have related to any part of the process, the imaging, the staining, so that we can actually see these cells, um, any of the genetics that are done to produce an image like this, and then the analysis pipeline itself. Okay. I'll stop sharing my screen. And I'll be looking at the chat as well now. I haven't yet seen it, but ah, I see some questions here. So the first question, could you explain why the cells glow under the laser light and also about the genetic manipulation that is done to the red cells? That's an excellent question. Um, so in these cells, um, there exists what is called a Crelox system. And essentially in the red cells, um, those red cells have dopamine receptor one, um, basically proteins. And you can do genetic manipulations such that in these dopamine receptor cells, so in the cells that will eventually glow red, you tag to it using genetic engineering, um, a protein that's called Cree. And I like to think of Cree as Pac-Man or uh, a little protein that goes around and chews DNA, essentially. And in the DNA, you put um, what are like little flags for the Cree. So let's say here's DNA and you have flags. The Cree will go and eat parts of the DNA and take that away. And long story short, through this Cree locks manipulation, um, if you study genetics and you know what a stop codon is, it's basically a stop sign that says do not express a protein. You remove that using Cree locks and you transcribe, and translate, you express then this protein, which is a red fluorescent protein called TD tomato. And that is a protein which is 
Im immunofluorescent, which means that when you shine a laser on the protein, electrons that exist in the structure um, of these different protein areas become excited. And then if you've learned about it in physics or chemistry, they jump up energy levels and they drop back down. And through that process, um, that results in fluorescence and they emit light of very precise wavelengths, which in this case is TD tomato red, red, flu red fluorescent protein. And those specific wavelengths of light are on the scale of nanometers. Uh, for, for the wavelength, and we can precisely identify what that is using spinning disk confocal microscopy. We can filter light within that specific wavelength, and by doing so, um, we can see that nice bright red color. And we know because it is that wavelength that is tagged to the precise electron uh, movement that results in fluorescence, which is a result of the protein which is in the DRD1A tagged cells. Um, so long story short, um, that is how you get the cells to glow. First, you have the protein. It's excited with the laser. It emits light, and we can precisely pick up and measure that light. Does that answer the question? And feel free to uh, put in the chat or message individually. Um, the next question. What is your opinion on using nanobots for neural imaging? Um, do you think it is the future of imaging? I'm not familiar with nanobots for neural imaging, and I would be fascinated uh, to learn more. Um, I have never used nanobots. I'm not aware um, of any labs. I'm sure they, they exist either here or close by. Um, but I think that even before getting to nanobots, there's so much that can be done non-invasively or without nanobots. I think that it also would depend on the scale of the imaging and the analysis that you want to do. If you want to look at the whole brain, um, and I'm assuming that you're meaning like inter-tissue nanobots, um, there, there are quite a few questions that can be answered without nanobots. Um, so if it's the future of imaging, potentially, it may constitute a part of the future of neuroimaging, but certainly not exclusively. You have all different types of methods. You have just regular microscopes. You have these confocal micros, uh, microscopes um, and this fluorescent imaging. You have MRI um, and many, many others, all of which are complementary and tell you very different things about the cells and the tissues that you're looking at. I think that the, the future of imaging will involve increasingly big data sets and more and more sophisticated and precise imaging methods in themselves. Um, for example, light sheet fluorescence microscopy involves actual tissue clearing. So um, by applying different laboratory techniques, you make the brain transparent. You make it completely clear. You can do this with other organs, with livers. You can even do it with whole organisms. You make it completely see-through. And then you apply sheets of light and you use the lasers and you can actually image full tissues and full organs in three dimensions. And I think that that is going to become an increasingly big thing in the future of neuroimaging and just imaging in general, um, although it is very expensive. I think costs with growing technologies will decrease. It's very expensive and massive file sizes. So to do one little tiny piece of tissue that's smaller than the size of your fingernail, you're looking at a terabyte of data storage. So it's a complex interplay between costs, storage, facilities, and technological advances themselves. Um, does the amount of functionally silenced cells contribute negatively to the brain? I wish I knew the answer to that. And uh, in some ways, yes. In some ways, maybe it doesn't have any effect whatsoever. Um, but that's that's why we do the neuroanatomy. Because with these brains, we can look at the living animals themselves as well. Um, th these are separate from the ones that we are imaging, um, obviously. But... Um, you can see if if there are behavioral deficits. So, for example, um, there are some manipulations where you functionally silence a region of the brain, and that leads to a motor phenotype, say, where 
um, the animals similar to in a human condition um, of upper motor neuron disease. They start losing the ability to grasp um, and motor function movement is impaired. And we can clearly um, see how that correlates um, to different neurons in the brain, different parts of those neurons, even the axons um, changing. So the amount of functionally silenced cells contributes negatively to the brain. Yes, depending on the type of cell, um, some really have no effect and some have massive and very detrimental effects. But that is that is the purpose of the imaging and analysis to try to figure out which cells that applies to, to what extent. Um, and then how that relates to the behavior. Are the different colors of the cells related to the type of tagging? And so which protein it becomes associated to or due to the type of cell alone? So sorry, are the different colors of the cells related to the type of tagging? And so which protein it becomes associated to or due to the type of cell alone? So if I'm, please, please correct me if I'm uh, mistaken with this, question, but if I'm understanding it correctly, um, yes, different colors of cells relate to the type of tagging that is done. So in the images that I showed, there are two types of tagging. One is the fluorescent reporter. So um, the one with the uh, great first question, how, how does the genetic manipulation work that makes the red cells glow under the laser? That's that Crelock system. So that's one type of tagging where um, the, the tagging, the protein is intrinsic to the cell expressing the Cree protein. Um, the other types of tagging happen due to immunohistochemistry. So um, if you've taken maybe grade 12 biology, you may have learned a bit about this. Um, if not first year university, um, biology should certainly, um, are called primary antibodies and secondary antibodies. Um, which is again kind of like a a flag and a tag, and you tag the protein um, with another protein that has a fluorescent molecule on it. So rather than with the red cells, you have DNA being trimmed and the protein is expressed and then uh, you shine a laser on it and it glows. Using immunohistochemistry, you have chemicals that you put into little dishes uh, with the tissues. Um, and then these proteins can associate with their tags and their targets. And then once that happens, you wash it and you add other chemicals. And then when you put it under the microscope, similar thing, you shine the laser, that tag glows and you know that that tag is associated with your protein of interest. And so by using this, um, you can identify or flag many different proteins therefore many different cell types. Um, so when you ask, are the different colors related to the type of tagging and which types of cells? Yes, but please correct me if I'm misinterpreting, uh, if I'm misinterpreting your question. I'll go on to the next question and come back to it um, if, if, there's a, if there are further follow up. How can you translate this from mice to humans in a process that takes decades? Um, everything that we see in mice, we ultimately want to use it to inform a development that will benefit humans. So comparative anatomy um, involves looking at different regions of the mouse brain and seeing how that relates to human brains. So for example, in the cortex, um, the red cells are the layer 6B cells, and those have a very similar transcriptomic profile. So the different genes that are there, the, the DNA, the types of proteins that are expressed, it's very, very similar to what are called white matter interstitial neurons in humans. And these white matter, stitchal, white matter interstitial neurons actually lie below the, the cortex and are in the white matter in the brain. And that P10 manipulation, um, where the cells are functionally augmented, that is a gene. That's one of the one of the genes that has been implicated. One of the many genes, uh, I must say, that has been implicated in uh, sleep comorbidities and autism and schizophrenia. 
and uh, ADHD as well. And we see in human brains, um, in postmortem brains, so brains of patients um, who have passed away, um, that these cells are have are increased in number. The cells are bigger. They exhibit these very prominent and large uberizations. Um, and that is similar to what we see in the mouse brain. Um, and, and first, and part of what I'm working on is trying to see to what extent that's true in different regions of the brain in a mouse brain. Um, and we can't very readily do some of the experiments and tests on um, living human brains. It's not possible, but in postmortem tissue or in mouse brains, we can then test and we can um, see what type of interventions, for example, like rapamycin torn one might potentially contribute in part um, to fixing the phenotype that we observe. Um, so that's just one example. How can you translate from mice to humans? First is relating analogous structures. And then second is trying to understand the unknowns using animal model systems, um, using the best and most responsible methods that one can, minimizing animal research at all costs. Um, but when there is no other option, when studying something like the brain, um, you can't only study cells in the dish. Um, then looking at the full tissue, um, and then once there are solid findings, moving towards human trials eventually. And I'll, of course, take follow-up questions. Uh, the next question, how are you able to find out that the cerebral cortex has layers and how are you able to find out the functions of these layers? That's another great question. Um, and there are decades and centuries even of work that has gone into characterizing these different layers of the cerebral cortex. Um, started even with uh, Cajal centuries ago, um, looking at different brain tissues and seeing simply at first that the cells just look different. Some are big, some are small, some have branches that go to the upper layers, some have branches that go um, across layers, and some send the projections all the way down into the subcortical regions like the thalamus that glowed red in the middle of the brain. Um, so just looking at the neuroanatomy, just qualitatively saying this looks different from this. Um, that's one way, especially at the beginning, that you can look and find out in that historical research figure found out that the cortex has different layers. Um, you can look within the layers themselves and see that there are different densities. So, for example, layer four is a very, very dense layer. It's even called a granule layer, dense granule layer. Um, and it's, it's kind of in the middle. Um, and even in different parts of the brain, there's one region called the barrel fields where they look like there are little barrels in mice. And these actually correspond to whiskers. So one whisker relates it precisely to a barrel. Um, and there are many different experiments that have been done showing that when you change or if you if a whisker is snipped, it completely changes the neuroanatomy and the structure of this the barrel cortex and cells that are related. Um, and researchers are still continually always trying to figure out the precise relationships between these layers um, because the neuron communications within and between layers are fluent, they change, and they are not, not completely understood fully. Um, different ways that we can find out the functions of these layers. Electrophysiology is another key technique that you can use. So um, you can use probes that you stick into the tissues and into the cells individually, even it's called patch clamping, and you can measure the electrical activity of individual cells. And you can use retrograde and anterograde tracing and virus injections. So you can stimulate one cell and you can record and see which other cells this first cell is communicating with. Um, kind of like using a multimeter in electronics. If you've, if you've ever tinkered with electronics, you can put one end in one region, one end in another region, and if you run a bit of electricity, measure at the other end and see if both are lighting up and if there is indeed a spark or, or a, a wire that is connecting them. So that's one way of trying to define which regions are connected. Um, 
And then you can overlay that with immunohistochemistry, the imaging, and the analysis to correlate structure and function. I know that that doesn't answer the question because that question hasn't, it still is not answered, but I hope it provides a, a little bit of an insight. Um, and again, I'm happy to take follow up. So uh, next one, lifestyle can affect the neuroscience of the brain and neurotransmitters. Would it also have an effect on the proportions of functionally silenced cells? Or is that effect solely or primarily by genetic predetermination? Uh, would this have effects on preventing neurodegenerative diseases? This is another great question. So I, I think there are so several questions looped in here. Um, the functionally silenced cells are genetically engineered manipulations that are strictly in these mouse brains that have the Crelox, um, that have the Crelox system. Um, that is genetically predetermined. To what extent this is true and to what extent lifestyle affects that is something that I don't think has been studied with this specific SNAP25 DRD1A CRE model. Um, in humans, though, lifestyle certainly does affect the brain um, and the relationships between different brain regions. However, if a, if a cell is silenced, and the exon in, say, SNAP25 is fluxed. It is not there. It's not going to come back um, because of uh, different lifestyle factors. That's not to say that um, potentially other regions may compensate differently because of lifestyle modifications, um, but lifestyle modifications on the SNAP25 construct in this mouse line will, will not. Um, but this will this have an effect on preventing neurodegenerative diseases, different lifestyle changes? Again, those are questions that uh, like a lot of people are asking, and it's such a great question to ask, um, and, and we don't know the answer to exactly how lifestyle changes um, can prevent neurodegenerative disease. There are lots of bodies um, of evidence uh, showing that Good nutrition, good sleep are instrumental uh, in, in good health, but precisely what and how relates to neurodegenerative conditions and different types of neurodegenerative conditions are all very hot topics in the research field. Uh, so uh, coming back, how are the chemicals um, like proteins and tags inserted into the brain? How do you make sure it goes to the section of the brain you wish to study? Again, great question, and that is linked to where Cre is expressed. So the, the Pac-Man, the, the protein, the Cre protein that goes around and snips the DNA, that is tagged specifically in cells, um, in this case, uh, which express dopamine receptor 1A. And so by tagging the Cre protein to another protein that we know exists in a specific cell, population distribution in the brain. So these DRD1A cells we know are localized to that thin low layer of the cortex, layer 6B, a bit of layer in some parts, quite a lot of layer 6A. Um, we know that that CRE will be expressed only in those cells. Sometimes there is off-target expression and we need to very carefully screen for that. Um, there are different mouse lines where the CRE expression is slightly different from others, even though they are all supposed to be tagged to DRD1A, dopamine receptor 1A. Um, it's something you ha you'd have to watch out for. So theoretically, you should know exactly where the Cre protein is. Um, you always check um, because where the Cre protein is, that is where these fluorescent proteins and tags uh, will be expressed by virtue of the Cre protein snipping the stop signal um, the stop codon, such that the protein can be expressed. So it's a genetic technique to make sure that the tags are precisely where we intend. Next question, what about mice brains makes them popular for brain studies over other animals and rodents? 
So mouse brains exhibit a lot of similarities to human brains, especially in the cortex. The mouse brain is a six layered structure. Not all um, not all other animals have a brain with six layers. Um, we would rather use mouse brains over, say, uh, monkey brains. Monkeys are considered a higher order species and we want to conduct as little animal research as possible, always. Um, a lot of work, say at Oxford, is also done in Drosophila, so in fruit flies. Well, fruit flies don't have the same six layered structure as a mouse brain. Um, and significant research and work has done showing these similarities between mouse brains and human brains. Um, one major difference between mouse brains and human brains is a lack of gyri, so folds, folia, fissures, um, sulci, gyri that um, simply don't exist in the mouse. So certainly there are flaws to using mouse model systems and say a uh, macaque brain would be much more similar to a human, but any any chance that there is to avoid studies on macaque brains, um, invasive studies on human brains, um, and then after invasive studies on mouse brains, we want to do by computational means or cellular techniques as much as possible. Um, other rodents are certainly used for other applications. So for example, rats are are ideal in some uh, for some research. Um, and there are other animals um, for, for other types of research as well. For example, auditory studies, ferrets are common for studies involving torpor and hibernation, hamsters. Um, but that's all very specific to the questions that are being asked. And for the cortex, the mouse is a good model. So basically the layers of the brain under various cell indicators are photographed to form a 3D model which indicates the multiple cell clouds in the brain. The functionally silenced cells are identified by the lack of branches extending from them. This is used as research material for cognitive disabilities. This is correct. If not, please fill out the blanks. Um, so the layers of the brain under various cell indicators are photographed, imaged, yes, to form a 3D model. Um, which indicates multiple cell clouds or cell populations um, in the brain, yes. Um, the functionally silenced cells are not identified by the lack of branches. Um, they still have branches. The branches just aren't as bright, but the branches are still there. The branches just cannot release neurotransmitters from the synapse. So within the synapse, the synapse is at the extension at the end of the branches of the cells. And the neurotransmitters are in the synapse and they form vesicles, which are normally released into the cleft and then are received and transmit a signal to the next neuron. In the cells that are silenced, the vesicle cannot fuse with the membrane within the synaptic cleft. So SNAP25 is a member of the snare complex and it's something that you will, uh, that, that is in uh, different, te different biochemistry textbooks or biology textbooks. Part of the snare clump complex and one exon 6a is fluxed or truncated which is the manipulation that we do um, in our studies um, snap 25 is a calcium dependent agent that in that facilitates the fusion of the presynaptic vesicle to the membrane to release neurotransmitters into the cleft when snap 25 is truncated that transcript cannot is is not made properly the protein cannot do its function and the vesicle cannot release its signal uh, towards the next neuron. Um, but again, the cells grow normally, the cells are still there, the branches are still there, similar densities, they just can't communicate with the next. Um, yes, this is used uh, as research material. Um, for cognitive disabilities, um, to try to research cognitive disabilities, um, brain disease in general, disorders of brain state um, specifically. And yes, this is correct. Good question. So a follow-up question, why are dopamine receptors used and not other neurotransmitters? Other neurotransmitters, so specifically dopamine receptors, receptors for other neurotransmitters are absolutely used. That's a great question. And for example, RBP4 Cree retinal binding pro, uh, protein 4 Cree targets layer 5. So where RBP4, retinal binding protein 4, is expressed, 
Cree exists. So if you do the same SNAP25 manipulation, layer five is silenced. And I also work with that mouse line. I just didn't mention it here and didn't show any pictures. Um, and we can study the behavior. These animals have very disturbed sleep. They have disturbed eating patterns and they have a motor phenotype where there's motor degeneration. Um, and that may tie in um, to, I guess, different hypotheses of top down or bottom up neurodegeneration profiles that relate to motor output from the cortex, which exists coming from layer five um, to peripheral system to peripheral uh, tissues. Um, so here, in order to study subplate remnants or a subpopulation, I guess, of subplate remnants in layer 6b, we use dopamine receptors. Um, but for so many other applications, there seem to be an infinite number of other uh, receptors and targets that can be used. Uh, next question, over multiple probings of the brain, has there been a trend of similar or specific functions with probe spots over multiple brains? Yes. Many, many studies. Um, Jack, are we getting close to close to time? We are, yeah, a little bit close. I mean, there's not there's any, I feel like they're all quite complex answers, aren't they? Um, um, but yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think we, we could be here forever with open-ended questions, couldn't we? There's so many questions and people are so interested. Um, so I think we will have to call it to a halt there. Um, if anyone has enjoyed this talk, presumably people really have because there's so many questions and it's been so, um, like some of the questions are really high quality, so people can clearly listen in. Um, this is the last of a series of talks. So you may or may not know that we, this is um, part of our Insight series and the all the previous talks on a similar theme but across different um, aspects of science have been put on our YouTube channel. So please do check out those recordings. Um, you'll get a link to that in your follow up email. I mean, and with that really, all that's left is to thank Marissa. Thank you so much. It's been really, really interesting listening here. And thank you for taking the time to answer everybody's questions as well. Um, I can only apologize to those that we didn't get a chance to answer. Um, it's just the look of the drawer, I guess, when you've got so many people who are so interested in something. Um, but yeah, please do check out the other videos on YouTube. Um, 